It is Tuesday, April 5th. What an incredible Final Four we just witnessed. You're watching Right on Cue College Sports. That's right. Welcome in. Thanks for joining us right on Q College Sports. I am your host, Tyson Quiller. You are at the right channel because we are going to spend today reflecting on the Final Four, some of the fun, enjoyable points of the games, uh, who performed really well, who maybe came up a little bit short, and kind of some big picture takeaways about the landscape of college basketball moving forward. We're also going to hand out some of our right on Q College Sports superlatives for the players and the coaches of these basketball teams this year. Before I get into that, though, like, subscribe. Please, please feel free to share this content with anybody you think might find it interesting. Wow, we what a weekend that was. Look at these four guys. Well, you've got probably the greatest coach of all time on his way out. You got two of the best coaches going right now, and then a guy who may be joining them in not too long. Kind of the next generation coming up and taking the torch from the previous generation. So let's go ahead and let's start right here. The Final Four game that Kansas played against Villanova to earn the right to get into the national championship. This game showcased the next generation of coaches, like I was just explaining, Bill Self and Jay Wright. Since hiring Jay Wright in 2001, the Wildcats have made the Final Four four times and won two national championships, obviously the one in 2016 and the one in 2018. On the other side of the court, since hiring Bill Self in 2003, the Jayhawks have made the Final Four four times as well, and they now have two national championships. These two coaches are both phenomenal, will be, will be Hall of Famers for sure. Both of these teams really played well and played well together. Villanova is kind of known for hanging its hat on defense, but the Jayhawks were just hitting shots flat out. Villanova's strategy to keep the score around kind of the 60s was pretty much blown away early as Kansas uh, had 40 points up on the board at halftime. Ochai Abaji and the Jayhawks held a 10-point lead pretty much the rest of the way of the game, ended up winning it 81-65 to advance to the national championship game. In our other Final Four matchup, obviously this was the marquee one, you had probably uh, the greatest rivalry in all of basketball, and, and yet these two teams had never played in the NCAA basketball tournament. 11 championships between Duke and North Carolina, uh, and this was Carolina's 21st appearance and Duke's 17th appearance in the Final Four. These are two truly storied programs. Duke had the lead by three and a half on some strong post play from the big men, uh, Mark Williams and freshman phenom Paolo Banchero, but the heels guard play really kicked in in the second half, and this bunch looked very much, in my opinion, like the Baylor squad from a year ago. Strong, strong guard play, really stirring the drink, hitting big shots, really orchestrating well. Armando Bacot collected 21 rebounds in this game. Eight of them were on the offensive glass. That is massive. It extends offensive possessions. It gives your team more opportunities to score. The, the Duke big man, Mark Williams, had two quick fouls early in the first half, set out the entire remainder of the first half. Theo John comes in for him, and I just could not believe he, the, what he did, but also the fact that Coach K wasn't getting on his behind about it, he picked up four fouls in the first half. Their big men had foul trouble throughout, and that just opened the door for our big Armando Baycott to just dominate under the hoop as the Heels won 81-77. to Now, let's do a little reflection here on the career of Coach K. He was hired at Duke University in 1980 after coaching just five years at Army. Pretty remarkable. Uh, that they took a chance on him. In just 11 years, he brought Duke to their first national championship in program history uh, and then went on to win another championship the very next year as well. That has only happened twice since 1974. Pretty remarkable. Then Coach K went on to win three more championships at Duke, 2001, 2010, and 2015. Coach K had his Blue Devils in uh, 34 of the last 36 NCAA tournaments and has made the Final Four 13 times, the most of any coach ever. Coach K was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame in 2001. 
And here's a little bit of a dynamic. John Wooden does have 10 championships uh, compared to the five for Coach K. However, the tourney field when John, when John Wooden was winning those tournaments uh, was just 25 teams back in the 60s. Coach K holds the record for most tournament wins at 101. Wooden only had to win 47 games, tournament games, to reach the 10 titles. I've got to tell you, I think the tougher road is playing in this tournament now. I think it's fair to say Coach K may very well be the GOAT. I know he doesn't have the championships, but basketball is far more elite now. You have a 68 team field you've got to get through. It's nothing, it's not at all like it was in the 60s with UCLA. So here's a quick list of all the players that Coach K coached over his years. Obviously, Grant Hill, Christian Leitner, Jay Williams, Zion Williamson, J.J. Redick, Johnny Dawkins, Elton Brand, Shane Battier, Carlos Boozer, Sheldon Williams, Nolan Smith, and Jason Tatum. I mean, I mean, top-tier players from several different generations there. So we say congratulations to Coach K. I myself was never a big Duke fan, or Duke fan really at all. Back when I was a kid, uh, I was a big Maryland fan, and obviously that was kind of a, a big rivalry there. Uh, but you have to tip your hat to greatness, and Coach K is greatness. He or John Wooden, one of the two of them, probably the greatest college basketball coach of all time. Now let's turn our attention to that national championship game that we just witnessed last night, Kansas versus North Carolina. This battle of juggernauts. So let's start here with a quick recap. An Ochai Abaji 3 started things off, followed by a couple of uh, low post layups by Big David McCormack. And in the blink of an eye, the Jayhawks were out to an 11 to 5 lead, less than five minutes into the game. The two teams then traded buckets for kind of the better part of the first half until back to back three pointers from Big Brady Manick saw the heel surge into the lead. It then became a, pretty much the Armando Baycott and R.J. Davis show from that point forward as the duo outscored Kansas 14-2 in the last five minutes of the first half. Hubert Davis's 8C Tar Heels closed out the first half with a 40-25 lead on the number one seeded Kansas Jayhawks. That means not only was the offense clicking, shooting 56% from the field for the Heels, but also the defense was stifling, holding Kansas to just 25 points. They were shooting just 32% from the field. But I've got to say, the halftime adjustments from Kansas on offense, it was pretty clear uh, that they wanted to establish the post. Four of their first five buckets in the second half came from either Christian Brown or David McCormack in the low post. They were just finding mismatches and just exploiting them down under the hoop. Meanwhile, on the defensive end, they switched to a kind of a matchup zone that had the young Tar Heels confused. They forced up a lot of shots from outside, just kind of really tough outside perimeter shots. This kind of changed the whole complexion of the game. Off of a 25-10 to 10 run to start the second half, Kansas pulled even with Carolina at 50 with just 11 minutes left in the game. From that point forward, this was, I've got to say, maybe the best championship game that I've seen in many, many years. The two juggernauts went back and forth, trading huge shot after huge shot. That was one of the things that I really reflected on. I told my dad when I talked to him about this after the game, it, it, it kind of made me feel, re-remember why it was I fell in love with college sports. I mean, it was pure game. It, it wasn't a ton of foul calls. There wasn't one great player that fouled out of the game or some parade of free throws at the end of the game. It, it wasn't like there were some great blunders, uh, or anything along those lines. It was it was two teams that played excellent superior basketball, and they just went back and forth. Uh, one of the things my dad was telling me, and I totally agree with him, is, you know, if you're North Carolina, you got to at least understand. I mean, you're, I'm sure you're bitter and hurt that you lost, but you got you got to know those players, and, sa and the same for Kansas. Man, they played their hearts out. They left everything they had on that court. Uh, and that's just incredible, incredible basketball. It was so fun. Bill Self and Hubert Davis were just two classy, smart, elite coaches that were coaching really, really effectively, really, really well. Uh, just a really, really fun way to cap off a great, great
great basketball season this year. Kansas then outscored Carolina 22 to 19 in the last 10 minutes as their change on defense really kind of led to steals, some sloppy, a little bit of sloppy dribbling, uh, and, and then that led out to fast breaks. Uh, with just 22 seconds left and up one point, Kansas went back to old reliable, feeding David McCormack for the game-winning bucket over, I believe it was Brady Manick. Armando Baycott had gotten injured and was out for that play. Like I said, there were just so many dynamics in this game that made it incredible. But one of them for sure was this clash of the big men, David McCormack and Armando Baycott. They're both just real throwback, old school big man, kind of like your David Robinson, your Tim Duncan. I mean, they are fundamentally sound. They play really strong big man basketball under the hoop. And they, and they fight. They care. You can tell that they care. These two Goliaths went to war with each other and left everything on the court. Carolina then came down the court down three, and got two pretty clear looks, I thought, from the three-point range and missed them both before Brady Manick uh, kind of tried to kick the ball out for another shot, and it went out of bounds to turn over to Kansas. So, for Kansas, with just four seconds left, all you have to do is inbound the ball. Simple, right? Not so fast, my friend. Dewan Harris catches the ball, steps out of bounds almost immediately. This was unbelievable. This gave Carolina one last gasp attempt. Caleb Love got the inbound. He kind of double clutched and got a three up, missed it off to the left. But man, there was nothing that was left to be desired from this game. Uh, there were 18 lead changes in the game. Let me give you one number here to express how close this game truly was. Both North Carolina and Kansas had exactly 18 minutes and 32 seconds in which they were in the lead. They each had the lead for the exact same amount of time in this game. In a phrase that is often overused, but I think it's totally appropriate in this situation, this game was an instant classic. If you did not see it live, you want to get online, you want to watch this replay. It is so much fun. So much fun. So here's some notes and big picture thoughts. First of all, welcome to the show, Puff Johnson. The sophomore guard uh, from North Carolina hadn't even played a game until January 15th. He hadn't played more than 10 minutes in a game ever, ever in his college career. He ended up playing for 18 minutes, got 11.6 rebounds. He drew a big charge late in the game. He was a major, major factor. Secondly, what an incredible job Hubert Davis did with this squad. After they lost at home in a in really terrible fashion to Pittsburgh on February the 16th, they then dropped to 18 and 8 on the season. They really looked like they might not even make the tournament. So to go from that to, to this, to the national championship game, in less than two months is truly remarkable. Armando Baycott, I've got to tell you, he has legit NBA future, in my opinion, and has a true heart of a champion. He tied David Robinson's uh, 21 single-season double-doubles this year, and he had an NCAA record 99 rebounds in the NCAA tournament. As for the Jayhawks, Although Ochai Abaji won the Final Four Most Outstanding Player, I thought he came up kind of small in this game. Uh, he's done that a few times uh, through this season. The consensus All-American in this game went just one for four from three-point range, and he missed five pretty important, seemingly important free throws uh, late in the second half of this game. It really looked like he had the yips, uh, and that, that might be a real factor in Kansas losing this game had they have lost. My next big takeaway was the adjustment that Bill Self made at halftime. Christian Brown in the post over R.J. Davis and Caleb Love was just devastating and a brilliant, brilliant adjustment. It really, really was. Also, Remy Martin was unconscious for stretches of this game. He ended up scoring 12 points in the second half. Just big bucket after big bucket. He had a couple of really fantastic steals. Uh, on, on Caleb, Love, Caleb Love and R.J. Davis as they were rushing down the court. He reached in, tipped the ball away, uh, or if they were trying to post up, he reached in from outside the three-point line, tipped the ball away. And one final point. I know there's some disagreement on this, but the, when Armando Baycott goes down with about 25, 30 seconds left in the game, uh, and every player rushes down the court, Kansas on a fast break, and they pull the ball up, now, I don't know. 
the intentions of Dewan Harris, but but or I mean of Jalen Wilson. But they stopped. They waited for Armando Baycott to come back into the action. The referees took a timeout, and they were able to sub out Armando Baycott. I just maybe it was just the mood that I was in, but I just thought that was such a classy, classy move. Um, and and I I just think between both Hubert Davis and Bill Sell, complete class all the way from both of them. I really have to say I was impressed. So ultimately, Kansas wins their fourth national championship. Uh, the game was the embodiment of competition, I think, at its highest form. Like I said, no flopping, very little complaining to refs. Uh, it was made shots that drove the score rather than a ton of free throws. And both coaches, again, I think were just pure class all the way through. One big picture looking forward for North Carolina. I mean, you got to think the uncertainty of the coaching change. Trying to replace a Hall of Famer in Roy Williams. I think you found your man. And the game the, and the game of basketball as a whole, I think, is really at its pinnacle right now. I think supreme basketball, college basketball, is, is being played right now. The referees have some work that they maybe have to do. Not in this game, though. The referees were fantastic in this game. But that needs to grow and expand. But I think the game is really at its pinnacle right now. Now for Kansas. Well, the future is a bit more uncertain for them. Now they turn from the championship game to awaiting the looming punishment from the NCAA for their involvement in the F FBI investigation um, that took place uh, several years ago that took down Rick Pitino, Sean Miller, and others. Sources have told CBS Sports that it's likely that the damage will be severe and coming soon. Bill Self and the Jayhawks have been charged with five level one violations. We talked a little bit about that last week when we were talking about Penny Hardaway and Memphis. Remember, Oklahoma State was given a postseason ban at the start of this year for just four level one violations. Arizona last year was given a postseason ban for five level one violations. I will say, though, in my opinion, these rulings are always timed terribly. They seem very inconsistent. You know, the NCAA has proven that they just cannot enforce these rules effectively, efficiently, or equally across the board. Maybe there's just too many programs to watch. Whatever the reason is, they're not consistent, and they're not swift. These teams are receiving these punishments years and years after the players or the coaches involved uh, have, have committed the acts that warrant the punishment. And it was really trendy last year for a lot of sports sports writers and talking heads to be saying there should be one uh, independent arbiter over all of college sports that will make decisions. Because remember when we were having COVID, the first college football season, there were some conferences that played, some didn't. And these talking heads were saying, oh, no, they shouldn't be able to do different things. You know, some the NCAA or somebody should make them all do the same thing. Well, the reality is if we had that, all of the football games would have been canceled. We wouldn't have had any sports. So, I mean, if that's what you want, that's what you're arguing for. Also, I've seen a lot of talk now regarding the NCAA as well about the transfer portal activity. For those of you that don't know, there are now over 1,000 players who have entered the transfer portal from college basketball this year. I get it. That sounds like a lot of players. First of all, that doesn't mean all of them are leaving. Many of them put their names in the transfer portal and then remain at the school that they're at. They're just testing the water. However, even if they all do leave, that's an average of about two to three players per team. Every season, every team has roughly two to three new starters in their roster, and again, every year. Guys, the NCAA is terrible at everything. They've had many opportunities through the past years to get ahead of issues like player compensation or NIL, the transfer portal. Uh, conference realignment, or even the college football playoff, and they've dragged their feet. They're becoming irrelevant. It's just a matter of time, in my opinion. Now, let's take a look at our Right on Cue College Sports 2021-2022 College Basketball Superlatives. First up, we have Right on Cue College Sports, the big man rules category. These are the best players that had at least 14 double-doubles on the season. First up, we have Oscar Shibwe. Obviously, you guys know he was my Player of the Year candidate. 
the 6'9", 255 junior, averaged 17.4 points, 15.1 rebounds on the season, and collected a grand total of 28 double-doubles on the year. The only player that beat him out was Armando Baycott, North Carolina. The junior from Chapel Hill averaged 16.3 points, 13.1 rebounds, and put up a devastating 31 double-doubles. That ties the NCAA record with David Robinson. Then we have a three-headed monster here, Kofi Coburn, Graham E.K., and Janai Broom from Moorhead State. Coburn went for 29.9 points, 10.6 rebounds per game, and put up 17 double-doubles on the year. Graham E.K. went for 19.5, 9.6 rebounds, and had 14 double-doubles. And Janai Broom, Janai Broom, the freshman, 6'10", 235 from Moorhead State, put up 23 double-doubles on the year. Now, Janai Broom has entered the transfer portal, uh, so it'll be interesting to see what kind of activity or action he receives. I'm sure he'll be recruited heavily. If you are wondering whether he'll be recruited heavily or not, here's an indication. Kentucky basketball has already reached out to him to try and woo him to come play for the Wildcats. Next up, we have our Right on Q College Sports Guardians of the Globe. These are the best players this season that had at least five assists and 1.8 steals per game. First, we have Jamal Shedd from Houston, the 6'1 sophomore, had an assist-to-turnover ratio of 2.9, collecting 5.8 assists per game and 1.6 steals per game. Then, the taller guard, 6'5", senior Andrew Nemhard from Gonzaga, 5.8 assists a game as well, 1.6 steals, Assist to turnover ratio of 3.0. That was one of the best in the country. Our next three, we have Malachi Smith from Dayton. 2.7 assist to turnover ratio, 5.3 assists, and 1.8 steals per game. Wendell Green Jr. at Auburn, the sophomore, will be returning next year, from my understanding. 5.1 assists, 1.5 steals, and 2.3 assists to turnover ratio. And finally, you know him. You love him. He is a wild card in everything he does. The Arizona transfer to Baylor, James Akinjo. I talked to you guys about him a bunch this year. He's just a complete wild card. 5.8 assists per game, which is massive. He got two steals per game, which is also massive. Assist to turnover ratio of just 1.9. So that means he's giving you 5.8 assists per game, but also probably four turnovers a game. So when he's really good, he's really good. When he's really bad, he can be probably really pretty bad. But he makes the cut for our Right on Cue College Sports Guardians of the Globe group just barely. Next, we have our Right on Cue College Sports Sharpshooters Club. These are the best players in the country that shot at least 68% from the free throw line, 50% from the field, and 35% from three. First and foremost, Keegan Murray, the sophomore from Iowa, goes 6'8", 225, and was putting up 23.5 points per game. He met all of those shooting percentage metrics. Next, we have the junior from Colorado State, David Roddy. Our next three, the freshman phenom Chet Holmgren from Gonzaga, going 7'196". Bryson Williams, the senior from Texas Tech. And Ryan Davis from Vermont. Those last three all shot over 70% from the free throw line while all shooting just over 40% from the three. So how about our commander-in-chief committee? These are the head basketball coaches that I thought did the most impressive jobs this year. It is comparing their performance this year to last year, or for several of these guys, it was their first season. So let's start it off right here. T.J. Otzelberger from Iowa State. Their record last year at Iowa State was 2-22. and 22. They fired uh, Steve Prom. In comes T.J. Otzelberger. In his first year, Iowa State goes 22-12, and 12 as, and as an 11 seed, made the Sweet 16. How about number two? You know him, you love him, you just saw him. Hubert Davis from North Carolina. Last year, Carolina went 18-11 and 11, uh, under Roy Williams, the Hall of Famer. In comes Hubert Davis to replace 
Roy Williams in his first year as a head coach. They go 29-10, and 10, and as an eight seed, make the national championship game. How about Tommy Lloyd, also in his first year as a head coach, replacing Sean Miller. Arizona had a postseason ban last year. As a one seed, they made the Sweet 16, went 33-4 and four this year. And finally, Ed Cooley from Providence. They went just 13-13 and 13 last year. They went 27-6 and six this year. First ever Big East regular season championship in program history. And as a four seed, they made the Sweet 16. So that about wraps it up for today. I got to tell you, once again, remind you, go back, watch that national championship game. This basketball was some of the finest basketball I have seen in years and years. Lots of fun. But anyways, you've been watching right on Q College Sports. I'm your host, Tyson Quiller. Again, like, subscribe, share. Feel free to send me an email, right on QCS at gmail.com. And we will get at you next time.